This is episode 62 of the Millennial Life School podcast on how to love someone you disagree with. What's up, guys? Welcome to the Millennial Life School podcast, where it's all about inspiring and encouraging 20 to 30 something year olds as we figure life out together. Welcome back to another episode of the Millennial Life School podcast, where it's all about figuring life out together. If you've been enjoying this podcast and have learned a thing or two while listening, I want to ask for your help in spreading the word by leaving a review of this podcast on Spotify and Apple Podcasts, subscribing to the YouTube channel, and by sharing it with your friends on social media. I feel like I'm not the best at promoting my own stuff, so if you can help me out here, I would really appreciate it. Thank you. Mom, oh my. This is Millennial uh, Life School Podcast with Karen Kiron Han. Hey, <laughs> hey, friends and family of the internet world. It's your girl, Sharon. And I'm a little bit nervous today because... I mean, this topic that we're about to tackle in this podcast episode is a really challenging one, but I believe it's a really important one for everyone to take some time thinking about. And I've definitely been just spending a lot and a lot of time thinking on this topic this whole year. So I want to make this podcast episode and, you know, tackle a topic that is really challenging. The topic that I want to discuss on in today's episode is how do you love someone you disagree with? Especially on very emotionally charged, controversial topics like politics, abortions, vaccines, gun control, etc. I wanted to make this episode not because I'm an expert on this, or because I have perfect solution for this, but because this is something that I genuinely believe is very important and is worth really wrestling with for each and every single one of us. I've been having a lot of conversation with people around this topic recently. And like, there's times where I feel like I've just realized like, oh my gosh, there's a lot of people in this world who don't think like me and agree with me. And I've been especially challenged when I realized that there's actually a lot of really smart, kind-hearted, loving people who I love, but have felt challenged because I've realized like, uh uh-oh, like we don't agree on these topics. Like, what? How? And I was like genuinely confused because I think you know, the tendency is that you think everyone thinks like you. And when I realized that, oh, no, actually, not everyone thinks like me, it was like, how do I process this? (laughs) You know? So I mean, like, I think initially, when I first started to run into people who I don't agree with, my first reaction was this visceral feeling of like a little bit of judgment, of like, oh my gosh, you're one of those. Or this like eye roll of like, oh my gosh, this person is so dumb. Have you ever felt like that? Um, Also like side note, (laughs) I recently realized that this like, you know, the emoji with the eyes looking up. I very recently, actually like this week, found out that that emoji with the eyes looking up actually means like, oh my gosh, like I'm rolling my eyes. I'm so tired of your crazy stuff. Like, oh, I'm so annoyed. I like literally had no idea that emoji means that because I just thought it was just like this really innocent looking emoji. that's like, oh, like what's up there? So (laughs) I literally always used it like, oh, like I'm curious. Oh, look, what's up there? So when someone sends me a text that's like, oh, that's interesting. Like, oh, I'm curious to know more. I would send that emoji and be like, oh, interesting. (laughs) And someone, my friend recently messaged me saying like, no, Sharon, 
that means you're annoyed. And I was just like, oh my gosh, I had no idea. So this is a PSA to anyone that I've used that emoji with with eyes looking up. I literally did not mean to imply that I'm annoyed or I'm like rolling my eyes at you. I legit just thought it was this innocent face of curiosity looking up thinking, what is that? I'm curious to know more. Um, But anyways, (laughs) so sorry if you got confused by my um, emoji. (laughs) Um, But anyways, back to this topic. I think before I thought everyone I like, people who are genuinely kind, reasonable, smart, and loving beings would see the world the way I see it because the way I see things just makes sense to me. But in America, especially in the more recent years, I feel like it's become so polarized and everyone's opinions on both sides have become even stronger that I feel like navigating a healthy conversation around these controversial topics has become very challenging. And like, To be honest, even as I'm preparing for this episode, I think the temptation is to just like feel a little bit like uneasy, like, oh my gosh, I don't know. I don't know about this one. And like this tension of like, man, how do I really like love and understand people who just ah, like, I just don't understand, you know? (laughs) Um, so if you feel like that on certain topics where you're like, oh my gosh, like, oh, these people or like, you just feel like, oh my gosh, like, please don't tell me you're one of those people who think like that. If you feel like there's a little bit of this tension, a little bit of judgment and just difficulty in trying to love people who you disagree with, I just want to say, like, I get you, I'm there with you. And as I'm trying to learn how to be someone who's more loving and understanding in this situations, I hope that this podcast episode can be helpful for you as well. So for me, like when I'm faced with these challenging situations, what I like to do is actually call people who I think are smarter, wiser, and kinder than me to ask for their thoughts on it. So when I was wrestling with this question of how do I love someone I disagree with. I called Aaron Kim Alderman, who is actually on episode five of my podcast, and is someone that I look up to as a friend, a sister, and a mentor. And I asked her about this. I just wanted to get her thoughts on this because she and her husband, Chris, they actually grew up in two very different cultures and environments. She grew up in Seoul, Korea, and Chris from Kansas, America. And she told me that there were actually a lot of things that they had very different perspectives on. So I wanted to get her thoughts on how they navigated through their differences in a relationship. And what she shared with me was actually very helpful and refreshing. And not just in terms of, you know, romantic relationships, but I think this would be something that'd be very helpful for everyone to just think about and just friendships or neighbors and just relationships, period. She said when it came to their differences, instead of seeing them as red flags in their relationship, they approached it with curiosity and an attitude of appreciation for their differences. She said when it came to differences, Chris said something like this to her. He said, well, if we were the same, we might as well be single. What's the point of being together? We create synergy by being different and bring each other new perspectives. And I thought this was such a good attitude to have because I think sometimes when I run into people who I disagree with or we are on two different sides of these controversial topics, I think immediately it's kind of like, oh my gosh, like, oh, I don't know how I feel about this. Ooh, like, oh, I'm not sure. And I feel so much um, like tension and I just all of a sudden like lose peace in that relationship. But the way that they approached it was more like, oh, like that's so interesting. Oh, I want to learn more. So instead of coming 
with judgment of like, oof, I don't know about that. Or like, oh, like, I'm not sure, like, you know, I'm not sure if I, if I can see this relationship work out because you think differently. It was more like, wow, look at this. Like, because we have two different perspectives, like we can learn so much from each other and having this attitude of curiosity and seeing differences as something that is actually a, an opportunity for growth and for learning. And I think this was just such a beautiful example of how we can approach, you know, people who think differently from us. And after talking with her, like I felt so much more confident that I can love people I disagree with because, you know, this can be something that is actually very challenging. I think in many cases, when we run into people we disagree with, the temptation is to feel like it's our duty to defend our opinion with a sense of self-righteousness that says, my way of thinking is more morally superior than yours. And I must rescue you from your ignorance. <sighs> wow. Like, even just like saying this out loud, like I've never said this out loud, but I feel like just reflecting back, there have definitely been moments when I felt like this. And it's very humbling because when I felt like, wow, like my way of thinking is more morally superior than yours and like I need to correct you and like educate you and teach you to think my way because I my way is better. I've like, I can recognize my own pride, ego and self-righteousness in that way of thinking. And really, I think in trying to navigate this difficulty of trying to love someone who I disagree with, I've realized that instead of focusing on trying to defend and project my own opinion to other people, what I really need to do is just take a moment to quiet down my pride and judgment and just get curious with the heart to learn. Like, oh, interesting. I've never thought that way. I'm curious to learn what makes you have this perspective. And this way of thinking really shifts the goal from wanting to be right and to win the argument, to actually wanting to learn. And I think in doing so, you become someone who is willing to hear the story of the other person with the heart to understand why they see things the way they do, instead of being someone who just thinks they are more right than the other person. So, First thing I learned while wrestling with this challenging question of how can I love someone I disagree with? It's this. First, be curious and be willing to learn. So instead of being scared of running into differences with people I love, I can view differences and relationships as something that could be good and beneficial to learn and grow from. But you might be thinking like, Sharon, this is easier said than done. Be curious and be willing to learn from someone who you disagree with. Like, uh, no, thank you. I already know I'm right and they're wrong. And if you find it to be difficult to have this heart of curiosity or even just the willingness to learn from the other person, I think the second thing that I've learned might help. I think what's helped me to have this heart to understand and have more empathy for people I disagree with is by realizing that actually there's many different factors that, that play into why people believe what they believe. As in the reason why they disagree with you 
is not necessarily because they are dumb, selfish, and morally inferior than you. So your background and the people you're surrounded by influences your beliefs. And as I was like thinking about this, I like thought of this example that just in my mind helped me to put it into perspective and hopefully this can too. So let's say, for example, to just simplify this whole situation, that there is a country named Frutisia. And in this country of Frutisia, there's this heated controversial debate between which fruit people should go for to be their country's fruit mascot, apples or bananas. And in this land of Frutisia, let's say you grew up in neighborhood A, where you grew up always eating apples and your parents always told you growing up that an apple a day keeps the doctor away. And your grandparents, who are just the most amazing, kind-hearted people you know, are apple farmers. And your friends and your friends' parents, your teachers, and even your friendly neighborhood grandma always says good things about apples. And they always say that apples should represent the country of Frutisia. And these pro-apple comments were actually very valid points. And, you know, like things like apples are rich in antioxidants, fiber, and vitamin E, and it's good for you. And even in the church, church leaders from your neighborhood, let's say, were quoting scripture and saying things like, well, in the Bible, Psalm 17, 8 says, keep me as the apple of your eye, hide me in the shadow of your wings. And the pastor would say things like, I feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit saying that Vertesia is the apple of God's eye. And in order for our country to be protected under the shadow of God's wings, for the sake of the future of our children, we need to vote for apples. Whew. My goodness. These, um... <laughs> okay, I don't want to comment on this. <laughs> Um, but anyways, uh, let's say in neighborhood A, all you hear are these good things about apples and all you hear about bananas are these negative things and not even just bad things about bananas themselves, but negative comments on what type of people banana supporters are. Like you say, let's say a teacher you really honor and respect says something like this. Oh, those banana supporters. All those banana supporters have gone bananas. They are crazy and irrational. And you go on social media and the algorithm, knowing that you live in neighborhood A and considering that most of your friends tend to like content that support apples, only show you pro-apple information. So let's say that's your background. And that's what you've heard and experienced all your life. In that situation, most likely, you'll probably be an Apple supporter yourself. I mean, like, this is a totally fictional scenario. But man, like, just thinking about this actually makes me pretty convinced that I will vote for apples. But then... Let's just imagine and say that instead of growing up in neighborhood A, you actually grew up in neighborhood B, where there's a rich history of banana farmers. And the same kind of amazing grandparents you have, instead of being apple farmers, they are banana farmers. And in this neighborhood, all you hear are good things about bananas, like how they improve your digestion, digestion, or put, or improve your digestion. Why can't I say this? Digestion. Um, are potassium rich and can help lower your blood pressure and improve kidney health. And even if you grew up to be the same logical kind-hearted person that you are today in neighborhood A, let's say if you grew up in neighborhood B with this background 
and the opinion of the people you love and you grew up with are all pro bananas. I feel like it is very possible that you probably might be an avid banana supporter. So for me, as I started thinking about like, man, like why, like, why are there like such like polarized opinions on all these different things? And I started to ask myself, like what factors have played into me believing what I believe? And I realized that what I believe on certain topics is pretty in alignment with what most of my friends, family, and people in my neighborhood tend to believe. And it just got me thinking like, wow, if my parents believe something else, and I grew up in a place where most people around me believe something else, is it possible that I may be very convinced to believe something else? And my conclusion was, yeah, probably. And I realized that sometimes people who believe something different from me are like shocked by what I believe as I am shocked by what they believe. And it just made me realize like, wow, I think like there's more things that play into the roles of how beliefs are formed And if I believe that there's very valid reasons as to why I believe what I believe, I'm pretty sure that people on the other side of the perspective also have pretty valid reasons as to why they believe what they believe. And that's been really helping me to understand that there's a lot of things that I probably don't know. And it just helped me to recognize that my opinion is actually just one side of a very complex situation. I think what I'm seeing is definitely a pretty important side that needs to be acknowledged, but also I need to know that it's just one side of the story and it's not the full picture of the situation. And in some ways, like I was thinking about this and I think it's kind of like this crystal. Um, <laughs> I bought this long time ago when I was really into photography. But anyways, if you were to look at this like very interesting shape of this crystal that I'm holding... I've realized like in some of these situations, I'm seeing just one side of things where let's say like I'm looking at this side and this side, when I'm looking at it, I am very fully convinced that I am looking at a triangle because it is a triangle. But for another person, let's say another person might be looking at the situation from this side and for them, it's like a rectangle. And it made me realize like, oh, wow, maybe sometimes we're just arguing like, is it a rectangle or is it a triangle? When it is both a rectangle and a triangle. And it's just, it made me realize like, oh, like what I see may not be the full picture of the story. And in order for me to get a better understanding of what the whole thing actually looks like, I need to be curious and be willing to listen and to hear from the other person. Because in the end, I don't think in these situations, like the point shouldn't be to try to convince other people that my my way of thinking is the truth. And we're all constantly arguing like my truth versus your truth. But I don't think it's my truth versus your truth type of situation and trying to say my way of thinking is the truth and your way of thinking is the truth. But I think it's a collective way. And by understanding how other people are viewing the situation, we're actually getting closer to understanding what the truth is. 
And in order for us to get to the truth of the situation of figuring out what is this actual like complex thing and you have to spin it around you have to look at it from both different sides and you have to be willing to learn and be curious about what other person is seeing so that we can understand hey what i'm seeing is a triangle there definitely is a triangle to this but you can also see hey from the other person what i'm seeing is a rectangle and there definitely is a rectangle to this and you can see like oh like what are we actually looking at oh there's there's triangle and there's a rectangle and i think this just kind of helps you to understand the full picture of the situation and when i realized like oh wow the situation that i'm looking at is probably much more complex than what I'm just seeing and understanding. It was actually very humbling for me. Because, you know, these controversial topics like politics, abortions, vaccines, gun control, these are very emotionally charged topics because they're very important topics. And many of them are very personal. And there are topics that I feel very convinced that one side is more loving than the other. But I realized that, oh, my conviction is based on my own personal experiences and my background and what I have seen and witnessed. And for another person, that person might actually be doing the best they can and making the decisions the best they can based on their personal experiences and what they have seen. And even if you don't agree with them, I think we still have to acknowledge, hey, we're all just trying to do our best to make a decision that we believe is the best. And obviously, some people might actually you know, their intention might be a little bit murkier because of maybe there's, you know, money involved, power and other things that might be straight up from greed and selfishness. But even that too, I think I am, what I'm learning is to have compassion for their lack of character development, you know? <laughs> Just, I have to be like, okay, like that's where they're currently at. And I really hope that they can grow and become someone who is more loving. But like, I need to have empathy that like, man, I'm sorry, your character is just there right now. And I hope you can grow, you know? Sometimes you just, you just have to first try to understand if possible. I know it's hard, but I want to be curious and recognize the complexity of the situation and have humility to learn and to be willing to listen because you might be very surprised by what you hear about why they believe what they believe. And so, you know, just because another person is actually seeing something that's different from you, it does not invalidate what you see. I think each side of the situation can be very valid and each side has both pros and cons. And I think oftentimes, you know, when people approach these controversial topics, they approach it with this attitude of I'm right and you're wrong. And they're just trying to convince the other person and everyone around them that they are right, that they're more smart, and they're more morally superior. 
And I just feel like that's just not the way, way to go about this. Like we really need to understand that, yeah, like both sides are very valid. Like let's take a look at this and let's learn from this. So these are all just things that I feel like has helped me to have more of an understanding, loving attitude when approaching differences. But after you recognize that there is different sides to the situation, and in the end, you'll still have this conviction about the situation, right? You'll be like, okay, like I speak. I looked at the side, I looked at that side, I listened and I learned, but given everything that you have gathered and learned, in the end, you know, you have to make a choice in terms of what you believe, right? And sometimes, you know, like what you have concluded and what you believe may be very different from another person that you're actually very close with. And in that situation, again, like, how, what are we supposed to do? You know, when I was wrestling with this situation in real life, I felt so uneasy as to how, like, I'm supposed to love this person and how I'm supposed to have a good, strong, loving relationship with people that I may disagree with. Let's say, you know, like your church members or someone that you're dating or a family member or things like that, right? You are willing to learn, but in the end, you believe A and the other person believes B. And because I was like, struggling with this so much with this tension I was like googling things like how do you love someone um, you disagree with and like looking up on Spotify like can you love someone you disagree with and all these different things but in the end I think the thing that actually brought so much clarity and peace and wisdom <laughs> into this that really helped me to understand like how I'm supposed to love people despite the differences, it was actually from um, these two passages in the Bible. And they kind of talk on similar topics, but these two passages that I found has to do with how you're supposed to live with people who have very different convictions than you. So the first passage is 1 Corinthians 8, and the other passage is Romans 14. So um, just to give you context, apparently back in the days, in the Bible times, the very heated controversial topic was whether to eat food sacrificed to idols or not. And this is what it says in 1 Corinthians 8. Now regarding your question about food that has been offered to idols. In my mind, as I'm reading, I'm like, oh, they're kind of like addressing like, now, about your question on this very controversial topic. And it goes on. Yes, we know that, quote, we all have knowledge about this issue. But while knowledge makes us feel important, it is love that strengthens the church. Another translation of this actually says knowledge puffs up while love builds up. And I just like got this image of like, you know, when people are trying to argue, but like, I have more knowledge on this topic than you. It's just like their head is getting puffed up and like, they just have a big head about it, big ego and pride of like puffed up with knowledge. Like I have, I know more than you. But anyways, it goes on saying, um, anyone who claims to know all the answers doesn't really know very much. It's like so humbling. Like, if you think you have all the answers, you probably don't know very much. Um, and then it goes on saying, but the person who loves God is the one whom God recognizes. So what about eating meat that 
that has been offered to idols? Well, we all know that an idol is not really a god and that there is only one capital G God. There may be so-called gods both in heaven and on earth, and some people actually worship many uh, lowercase gods and many lowercase lords. But for us, there is one capital G God, the Father, by whom all things were created and for whom we live. And there is one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things were created and through whom we live. However, not all believers know this. Some are accustomed to thinking of idols as being real. So when they eat food that has been offered to idols, they think of it as the worship of real gods and their weak conscience are violated. It's true that we can't win God's approval by what we eat. We don't lose anything if we don't eat it, and we don't gain anything if we do. Basically, it's like saying like, you might believe one way and like you are fully convinced and that you know, like this is what it is. But then it's like recognizing, oh, but not everyone knows this. And for another person, for them, it's different. They believe that if they eat food that's offered to idols, that it's actually violating their conscience of what they believe is right. And it goes on saying, but you must be careful so that your freedom does not cause others with a weaker conscience to stumble. And I thought that was so interesting. Be careful so that your freedom does not cause others with weaker conscience to stumble. Because I feel like, especially in America, like freedom is something that a lot of us really value. And we're like, my freedom. And it's like, freedom becomes such a priority. But sometimes it makes me think like, wow, I wonder if people are prioritizing freedom over actually what is loving. Anyways, <laughs> let me go on reading this. Uh, it says, for if others see you with your quote-unquote superior knowledge, eating in the temple of the idol, won't they be encouraged to violate their conscience by eating food that has been offered to an idol? So because of your superior knowledge, a weak believer whom Christ died will be destroyed. And when you sin against other believers by encouraging them to do something they believe is wrong, you are sinning against Christ. So this part actually like highlighted it, bookmarked it, because I was like, oh my God, that's crazy. What it says, like, when you sin against other believers by encouraging them to do something they believe is wrong, you're sinning against Christ. Um, and then it says, so if what I eat causes another believer to sin, I will never eat meat again as long as I live. For I don't want to cause another believer to stumble. This is what the writer of First Corinthians is saying. Like, even though I have the freedom to eat whatever I want to eat, if my freedom of eating whatever actually encourages the other person to do what they believe in their conscience is wrong, I believe that that's sinning against them and against Christ. So I'm actually going to lay down my freedom to eat whatever. And I'm actually, I will never eat meat again for as long as I live. Because I don't want to stumble the other person. And it just made me think like, as I was reading this, like, oh my gosh, like, dang, this is like so considerate of the other person that this the writer disagrees with. He's saying like, 
I believe that I have the freedom to whatever. But like the other person, I believe is in their weaker faith. But because of their weaker faith, like they don't, they think it's wrong to eat whatever. So, and like, because I'm being considerate of where they're at and what they feel convicted in. And because they believe that they don't have the freedom to eat food that's been offered to idols because they believe that eating that is a sin. I want to consider where they're at and what they believe and their convictions. So I'm actually, yeah, I, I, I'm actually not going to do things that's going to encourage them to actually go out of their belief and do something that they believe is wrong. And it's like, wow, that's like, I never thought about it in that way. And Romans 14 is another passage that kind of talks about this of like two groups, people having different convictions and how to live with people who you disagree with. So Romans 14 says this, accept the one whose faith is weak without quarreling over disputable matters. One person's faith allows them to eat anything but another whose faith is weak, it's only vegetables. So it's, I think it's kind of like similar reference to what uh, 1 Corinthians 8 is talking about. It says, the one who eats everything must not treat with content the one who does not. And the one who does not eat everything must not judge the one who does, for God has accepted them. And it like makes me think about like the people who I disagree with and to think like, oh no, like I shouldn't treat them with contempt or, you know, try to quarrel and like argue with them about this. And it made me realize, oh, like God has also accepted them. And it goes on saying, who are you to judge someone else's servant to their own master Servants stand or fall, and they will stand for the Lord is able to make them stand. One person considers one day more sacred than another. Another considers every day alike. Once again, like another kind of like controversial, like, am I right? Who is more right type of situation? And it says, each of them should be fully convinced in their own mind. I said, each of them believe they are right. But it goes on saying, whoever regards one day as special does so to the Lord. Whoever eats meat does so to the Lord, for they give thanks to God. And whoever abstains does so to the Lord and gives thanks to God. As in both of them are believing certain things and they're doing it so to the Lord. For none of us lives for ourselves alone, and none of us dies for ourselves alone. If we live, we live for the Lord, and if we die, we die for the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. For this very reason, Christ died and returned to life so that he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. You, then, why do you judge your brother or sister? Or why do you treat them with contempt? For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. It is written, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me, every tongue will acknowledge God. So then each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. Therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, 
make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in the way of a brother or sister. I am convinced being fully persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself. But if anyone regards something as unclean, then for that person, it is unclean. It's kind of like acknowledging like, I am fully convinced that I need to vote for apples. But if the other person believes that they need to vote for bananas, then like for them, that's what is right. For me, I'm doing what is right from what I believe. The other person may be just doing something that they believe is right in their own, with their own convictions. And for them to act according to what they believe is right, is right for them. If your brother or sister is distressed because of what you eat, you are no longer acting in love. Do not, by your eating, destroy someone for whom Christ died. Therefore, do not let what you know is good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit, because anyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and receives human approval. Let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All food is clean, but it is wrong for a person to eat anything that causes someone else to stumble. It is better not to eat meat or drink wine or to do anything else that will cause your brother or sister to fall. So whatever you believe about these things, keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the one who does not condemn himself by what he approves. But whoever has doubts is condemned if he eats, because their eating is not from faith. And everything that does not come from faith is sin. So like, man, these are two, two passages that as I was reading, I just started to think a lot more about like, how I'm supposed to act and behave and how I'm supposed to approach these topics. And it helped me to think like, man, like I think really loving someone that I disagree with is not me trying to convince them that I am right. It's not me really just projecting my opinions and saying, this is what I believe is right. But I think it helped me to understand that I have my own conviction and another person has their own conviction. And if that person believes that their conviction is more right, and they believe that their conviction is actually something that they believe because they believe that that's what's honoring God. And that's what they believe is loving in their opinion. Then who am I to try to convince them to do something else? Who am I? to try to convince them to go against their own conscience to think something else, right? I think it made me realize like, no, I need to honor them. And if they believe that, you know, believing one way is actually from a place of faith, then I need to encourage them to continue to believe and like, have faith and do what they believe is right instead of you know causing them to do something that they believe is wrong and I think it made me realize like both can be acceptable like this person can believe this way and that could be acceptable and I believe one way and that is also acceptable And like, in like thinking about this, actually, like, this is something that really helped me to have much more peace in this. 
and be able to kind of let go of the sense of control of trying to convince people that I'm right, that I have quote unquote superior knowledge to this. And it made me realize like, no, like how can I be loving? How can I, how can I be considerate of another person's own conviction of what they believe is right and what they believe is wrong? And preparing for this podcast episode, I actually asked this question on my Instagram story as well. And a lot of people sent in answers and I read through every single one of them. And a lot of people had very thoughtful things to say on this. You know, the question was like, how do you love someone that you disagree with? And I've got answers like, well, you need to listen and be slow to speak. Don't take offense and have compassion. Um, Another person said, just like spend a lot of time really actively listening. And a lot of people said like, yeah, like I think you can love someone, but it'll be very difficult. Like it won't be easy. And it's not, but I think that's why it's worth like discussing and sharing some of the things that we're learning on how to love people we disagree with better because it is not easy. And actually one of my favorite answers from Instagram was actually from Aran that I mentioned earlier that I called to talk about this as well. But she said this, she said, love is wishing them the best and meeting their needs. It has nothing to do with their opinions. I thought that was so good. Yeah, like wishing them best and meeting their needs really has nothing to do with their opinions. Um, man, that's all the things that I feel like I have learned while I was wrestling with this question of like, how do we love people we disagree with? And constantly, you know, I'm like learning this, you know, I'm not the best at loving people. And I think I, but I want to continue to love well and continue to be someone who is loving to people. And as I was really just like thinking about what love is and what that looks like, Like, how can I love? Well, what does love look like? I was looking through my journal and actually this year on March 26th, I was reading the Bible and doing like a devotional on love. And this is what I wrote down in terms of what I believe, what love is and what love looks like. I wrote, love considers others first. Love looks for the best in people. Love seeks to find things to praise. Love shows respect. Love seeks unity. Love isn't selfish. Love offers the best. Love is patient. Love is caring. Love seeks to serve. Love is humble. Love is sacrificial. Love is kind. And to add one more, Love is wishing the best for people. So I hope that we can all learn to be more loving people as we run into people who we disagree with and that we can challenge ourselves to think about how we can love the person the best we can. Because at the end of the day, I would rather be a person who is loving than a person who is right. I hope this episode was helpful. And I hope that this can encourage you to also take some time to think about this. Take some time to really think about what it looks like for you to love someone you disagree with well. Thank you all for being here. 
I genuinely love and appreciate you guys and see you guys in the next episode. Hey everyone, thank you so much for listening. If you are new here, send me a message on Instagram just to say hi. I genuinely love connecting with my listeners and I would love to get to know you better. Also, if you want to work with me as your personal coach or get access to other helpful resources, you can visit SharonKillonHan.com to learn more. And just a reminder, dear millennials, Know who you are and walk in it.